Dear Father, we thank you so much for the freedom to come together and study your word and worship you. Uh, we thank you for this group of believers that uh, is so loyal and faithful to you and um, who have become a close group of friends and studiers and followers of you. Uh, we pray that tonight that you will reveal your glory to us, what your glory entails and what it means. Give us a deeper understanding of who you are. Let us let people who are canoe to the to the Bible and to the one true God realize that the God we worship is a personal God, and He's He's got a name, and His name is Jesus Christ, and and He's and He came to this earth two thousand years ago to provide the ultimate sacrifice, so we might receive salvation and eternal life. So we pray that uh, we will be refreshed with a new understanding of Your glory. And we'll, we won't take this lightly, that we'll take this teaching tonight with fear and trembling and reverence uh, of the power of the eternal creator God that you are. Um, we know you're our friend, but you're also our Lord. And we, could never, uh, we, could, we should never minimize the greatness of your awesome power. And tonight we hope that you'll shine that in our hearts and you bring us closer to you. Amen. Okay. Um, Last week, we, uh, we, we started John chapter 1. Uh, and what a wonderful class that was. I had overwhelming uh, positive feedback from a number of people who attended by email and text messages after how, how moved they were from the, the teaching. And, um, and I'm really glad to hear that because this is the best, this is the most important teaching I think the world has ever had. Um, not, not by me, but by the, God, the Apostle John. He's left this for us. And, uh, and I've, I've, um, I've gone deep with this teaching, deeper than probably the average uh, pastor will ever go on a Sunday sermon. This, this is really kind of a seminary level uh, class in many respects, because I just love the word so much, I can't leave one thing out. And, and as I know, it's so important, everything's important. So last week we studied, um, really only we got to verse 14, and I said, think like I said, we, we didn't even finish verse 14. And it was one of the longest classes I ever had. It was almost an hour and a half. So tonight we're going to continue on through chapter one. And I brought this um, prepared to be broken into two chunks. So we'll see how long the first part takes. And then I'm going to um, stop the recording uh, and um, we'll take a, a little break, see how people feel. And we may continue with part two tonight, uh, which will lead us to the end of chapter one. And if not, we'll do that next time. Um, I'm not going to play the uh, the video of, um, that I played last week again, just due to time constraints. Um, but the John chapter one video is accessible through the website directly. That's crossroadoftruth.org under uh, resources. There's the gospel movie, so you can watch it again there, uh, or go to last class and re-watch it. Um, So I'm just going to start um, with a little recap of the, the first three verses last week. And uh, I'll read this to you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Um, so the only point I want to bring out tonight is to remind you that in these two verses, we see that the word is a title for Jesus Christ. It's referred to as he and him after. And, and, and it defines God as eternal. Jesus Christ was in the beginning. This was before Genesis 1-1. This is what this means. This is the literal translation. So this, this, in this three verses, Jesus is eternal, and he's also the creator of all things. So John wastes no time in defining who Jesus Christ is and his awesome power. So there's no debate as to who God is and who Jesus is. And then if you notice last week, I started off by linking verse 14 uh, immediately. I skipped all over the, the next nine verses and went to here um, because they're kind of linked. So if we continue on, it says, and the word, the same word, the logos, the God of the universe, the creator of all things, he became flesh. And this is a, this is a, a, a profound statement. You, you can't under, underestimate how important this these three words are because what this defines is what christians call the incarnation god becoming man fully god and fully man this is where this doctrine is is most clearly defined and i'll just continue on the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory 
the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So I've circled uh, four words on here, and we are going to spend the, this class primarily uh, peeling back what these words mean. And I, I think for many of you, this will be a revolutionary class, and um, it's going to really probe your um, the depth of your knowledge of God, and I, I think it's going to be a beautiful class. So the summary is, once the identity of the word is grasped, and the identity of the word is, is a title for Jesus, he's eternal and creator, so once that's grasped, and the incarnation is seen as a monumental act of revelation, then his glory is revealed. So now we're going to go, we're going to peel back through this, um, this first verse 14 again. So I said last week we covered this a little bit, and then tonight we're going to go through it in more depth. When the, it says the word became flesh, in the yellow box on the right, this says God became human in Jesus Christ and dwelt among us. Jesus himself was the tabernacle of God. So I think, uh, uh, so down at the bottom of this, this sheet, it says dwelt actually means tabernacle when translated in the Greek. So that's a tabernacle means the tent of meetings and it's where God dwelt and Moses um, spoke with God. Um, and we beheld his glory. So the tabernacle or the temple, Solomon's temple, was where the glory of God actually was. So you see how this is all connected. So Jesus himself was the tabernacle. He's defining himself as the tabernacle. And in the Old Testament tabernacle, this is actually where the Shekinah glory of God was to be found. Um, so now we're going we're gonna to go, keep going through this. This is so beautiful. Um, it, it's just wonderful. Okay, so we're going to go back to the Old Testament for a moment here. And you know, I think last week I might have said that in the introduction that Jesus throughout the book of John, um, draws on Old Testament um, symbols and, and features, I guess, to define himself as. And, and he's going to do this throughout John. But So right now we're starting with the temple himself. Jesus is defining himself as the, as the actual temple of God. This is, this is amazing. So let's look what the temple, what's, what the temple has to say. Here, in Exodus 25, 8, it says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Doesn't that sound familiar from John 1, 14? Joel 3, 17. So you shall know that I am your Lord, your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jer Jerusalem shall be holy. No aliens shall ever pass through her again. So there we see the word dwelling twice. Zechariah 2, 10. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Ezekiel 37, 28 and 29, it says, My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Um, Revelation 21, 22 and 23 says, but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord Almighty, Lord God Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Um, so there in Revelation, we see unmistakably Jesus is the temple. So I, I hope you can, uh, you're going to need to, I, as I always say, go back through these notes. They'll be online on the website after class. Uh, and really meditate on this. This is this this takes your your uh, understanding of God and of Jesus to another level of depth that I think few people ever get to. So it's very important. Uh, a couple more slides on the tabernacle. Um, John one fourteen when it says dwelt, that is actually saying Jesus was a tabernacle. And last week we saw that little video. And it actually showed Jesus walking around and it actually tur he turned into an actual temple walking around through the earth. That's exactly the imagery that's being said here in John. Now, if we look at what the tabernacle was in the Old Testament and look at what Jesus was in the New Testament, it's, am it's amazing the parallels. Uh, so it was God's dwelling place with men. The, temp the tabernacle was temporary. Remember, Moses kept moving it around, taking take it down and move it where we went. And Jesus was here temporarily as well and kept moving around. 
Uh, the tabernacle was the center of the camp. It was the place where the law was preserved. The Ten Commandments were contained in the ark. It was the place of sacrifice. It was where the priest fed, and it was the place of worship. All of these things have direct parallels to Jesus himself. Now, here's a little diagram um, of the, the main temple um, ornaments or monuments, I guess, within it. And I'm going to link it to uh, some of uh, Jesus' statements here. Um, why don't we start at the bottom here? We will walk, we're going to walk in the door of the temple. This is a very crude diagram. I made this myself. And we're, we're going to actually study the temple in much more depth as we approach the cross and we start talking about atonement and stuff. Uh, so this is a, an introductory thing. But if you notice, there's a door of the temple. And Jesus himself defined in, I think it's John 10, he said, I am the door. I am, we already went through the meaning of that. That is the actual name of God himself from Exodus. Um, and so Jesus is the door of the temple. Now the menorah, this, this is going to come from another teaching in John we're going to do. And I'm going to explode this in its full beauty. But when Jesus declared, I am the light of the world, uh, he did it in front of the temple, in front of these burning lamps on a festival night that was known for its burning of lamps. So he declares himself to be the light of the temple. The table of showbread, Jesus declares, I am the bread of life in John 6. So you see, he's defining everything about him as parts of the temple. And we see the golden altar that's representative of the intercessor for us, which would be, I guess, the Holy Spirit. We have the veil, which was ripped when, when Jesus was crucified. When he took his last breath, it says the veil of the temple was ripped, opening up the Holy of Holies now for all of us to go through. In the Old Testament, only the high priest, one person, was allowed to go into that Holy Holies, and it was one day a year, the Day of Atonement. When Jesus died, he opened up the veil of the Holy of Holies so we could all go in and um, and so just to continue here. The Ark of the Covenant, which was contained in the Holy of Holies, is our sin bearer. This is what contained the, the Ten Commandments and the, uh, the staff of Moses. And the mercy seat, which sat on top of the Ark, is what Romans calls the, our propiti pro the propitiation for sin. And we're going to, again, we're going to study this in more depth um, when we get to atonement. Uh, approaching the cross, but basically the uh, the high priest would would go in and and sprinkle the sacrificed lamb's blood on the on the mercy seat on the top once a year for the forgiveness of sins of the nation. And if God accepted the sacrifice, if it was an acceptable sacrifice, um, the nation would have another year of forgiveness of sin. But if it wasn't accepted for whatever reason, the high priest would be struck dead right on the spot. Um, so now, on the, on the top left box here, this is very profound. Um, Jesus was not only the temple itself of God, but he was the high priest, as defined in Hebrews and other places, and he was the final temple sacrifice in addition to all that. So this is, this is uh, pretty much as deep as it can get. Um, so Jesus, uh, yeah, it was... So we're getting we're getting closer to the glory of God here. Okay, uh, we'll we'll move on now um, to the next key word in this thing. Um, I've just posed a question here for you to all think about just for a second before I get into the teaching. What do you think of when you hear the phrase "the glory of God"? And no one needs to answer, but I just want you to think about it for a second because I think we ought, we probably a lot of us probably take for granted we know what that means. Um, we probably you know, have some very simple um, conception of what that might entail. But I know when I, when I did this preparation for this study, when I hit this phrase, and this is John 1.14 again, we beheld his glory. Um, I needed to peel back and do a separate side study on this because it's just too important to gloss over. Okay, so we're going to spend a few minutes on this. So when I said dwelt also means the residence and refers to the glory of God who made himself present in the tabernacle and the temple. Now the bright cloud of the presence of God settled on the tabernacle in the Old Testament with Moses and the glory of the Lord filled it. Uh, this is also shown in a pillar of smoke and fire and as a burning bush. This was all talked about as the glory of God. Now Jesus spoke about the temple of his body in John 2, and Paul taught that because we are united to the risen Messiah, we are the living 
the, the temple of the living God. I'm going to now just go through some scriptures here that I've got referenced. And we're going to keep peeling this back because the glory of God is not a simple answer. It's actually multifaceted. There's, there's various, uh, it's almost like the cross itself. There's, as I've heard people describe it like as a diamond, you know, where every, every side is, is illustrating a different um, depth of, of meaning. Uh, and this is kind of what, what we're approaching here with the glory of God. Let's read some scripture now. Uh, uh, the glory of God in the temple. So this is, this is where we're now uh, focusing. Uh, in Exodus 24, 16, it says, Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. So the glory of God is, is represented physically and visibly as a cloud. Uh, Exodus 40, it says, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In 2 Kings uh, 8 to 11, it says, And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. In John 2, 19 and 21, Jesus answered and said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. In 2 Corinthians 6, 16, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So there's a lot going on here. We're, just, we're showing, though, that, that um, how the glory of God in the Bible is related to the temple, both the Old Testament, Solomon's temple, Jesus himself representing the temple, and now the Holy Spirit living within us. So we hear this, uh, th this word Shekinah glory sometimes talked about. So Shekinah glory is the visible manifestation of God. And it means the dwelling of the divine presence of God. And this is actually Jesus in the flesh. That's what John 1.14 is saying. So all that glory we just talked about in the Old Testament that Moses saw, this is what Jesus, this is what John is saying he experienced when he walked with Jesus every day. He was actually, all the apostles and anyone who met Jesus was actually in the presence of the Shekinah glory of God. Uh, something that you know, we would just dream of, right? Um, they experienced it. What the Shekinah glory was to the tabernacle and temple, the spirit is to the holy people, the church, and the temple, which is the believer's body. Jesus' glory was also shown in his signs, he says, and he was supremely glorified in his death. The beauty of his presence and spirit, often thought of as, is, as the image of a brilliant light, and it's connected with his holiness and weightiness. That is his significance. So this, this word weightiness and significance is very important to the glory of God. Um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a light thing. This is why I say we, we need to approach this uh, in our prayer and meditation with, with some fear and trembling and, and, re and great reverence, uh, just as any, everyone in, in the Bible who uh, ever saw the glory of God did. Um, the disciples themselves, it says, often were, were feared when, when God would would perform his miracles like calming storms, et cetera. Um, so the Shekinah glory, um, it's, so this represents the Holy Spirit to, to the church now. Uh, in Ephesians 2.21, it says, In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Um, And Isaiah 60, 1 to 3 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. So here we see the glory of God referred to as light. When, again, reminiscent of when Jesus said, I am the light, right? Um, you can see how it, it all ties together. And actually, before we go on, I've, I've got a little video I'm going to show you. Uh, I, um, I was going to sh show this a couple of slides ago, but I'm going to show it now before we move on. So this, is a, this is a temple video. And I think this will 
provide some uh, some better insight into this. Uh, the internet's freezing up on me here. Let's see. Oh, uh, oh, okay, here we go. If you could go back to the city of Jerusalem during Bible times, the biggest thing you'd see is the temple. This beautiful building was designed by King David and built by King Solomon, and they believed that it was the home of the God of the universe. Wait, I thought God's home was in heaven. Well, the whole point of this earthly temple is that it's the place that overlaps with God's heavenly home. The temple is where God lives and rules all creation as king. That's cool, but even Solomon, who built the temple, didn't believe that it could contain the God of the universe, right? Yeah, the building was just a symbol, and it pointed to the fact that all of creation is God's temple. And that's actually what the first page of the Bible, Genesis 1, is all about. Really? It says that creation is God's temple? Well, it doesn't need to say it. The whole story shows it. In Genesis 1, God creates an ordered world out of a dark wasteland by speaking in a series of seven days. Then on the seventh day, God's presence fills creation as he takes up his rest and rule. Similarly, the tabernacle and later the temple were built and dedicated in a series of seven speeches and seven days, after which the priest or king could rest and rule in God's presence. Ah, so all of creation is where God intends to dwell. It's like his temple. Exactly. Now, turn the page to Genesis 2 and we get another portrait of creation. This one focuses in on the land. And in the center of the land is a region called Eden, which in Hebrew means delight. And in the middle of delight, God plants a garden in which God and humanity live together. And that's why the temple was modeled after the garden, filled with imagery of gold and flowers. The menorah symbolized the tree of life. It's the place where God dwells with his people. Oh, got it. And check this out. In the temple, the Israelite priests and Levites were to work and to keep the temple in God's presence. This is exactly the job description given to humanity in the Garden of Eden. So these humans were the first priests. But instead of ruling with God, they wanted to rule on their own terms, and they're exiled from the Garden Temple. And like Adam and Eve, Israel's leaders also wanted to rule on their own terms, and they too were exiled. The temple was destroyed, and this left them wondering, did God give up on Israel? Will God bring about a new creation? Well, the biblical prophets anticipated the day when God would create a new temple with a new priesthood. That's when God's presence would fill all of creation. And when the Israelites returned to the land, they did rebuild the temple. But that temple didn't turn out the way the prophets hoped. In fact, later Israelite prophets said that this temple was hopelessly corrupt. So they're still waiting for the ultimate temple. And here we come to the story of Jesus. He said that through him, God's presence and rule was coming into our world in a new way. And he presented himself as a new kind of priest. But Jesus wasn't a priest and he didn't work in the temple. Right. Jesus said that God's presence, his rest and rule was filling the world through his own life, death and resurrection. Jesus was claiming that he was the true temple and this new temple would expand out to include all of creation. That's a really big claim. And it got even bigger. After his resurrection, Jesus said that God's presence would come to dwell in and among his followers so that they would become mini temples. Communities of people where God rests and rules. Exactly. This is the Bible's vision of the church, which is described as a temple. Not a building, but people. Yeah, like when Peter says, you all are living stones built up as a temple for God's spirit to dwell. So at the end of the story, do we ever get a new physical temple? Well, not exactly. What we see is a renewed cosmic temple, just like Genesis 1. And this new creation doesn't need a temple building because through Jesus, all creation is now the place where God rests and rules the world with his people.
All right, I hope that um, solidified the some of the, the, the teaching up to now, a little more uh, with some visuals. And uh, we'll keep, we'll continue on. Um, so there's one other aspect of the glory of God. So remember, this is, we're still kind of talking about just this one, um, this one theological um, aspect, I guess, of God is, is all the facets of his glory. Um, and we, we know that the temple is, is one of the main areas where his glory was, was all, always dwelling. But um, another area of the glory of God um, is the law. And this is, uh, this is really profound. And it, if I had more time, when I do my teaching on righteousness in Romans, um, this is a core part of that teaching. But I, I didn't think I could leave it out because if we're going to really cover the glory of God, we, you need to understand this. Um, so the law is the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments actually represents the character of God himself, believe it or not. This is, so the law reflects the glory of God. And one verse that will sum that up um, most with most the most authority probably is, is Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. After after an entire book of Solomon searching his life for the answers to the purpose of life, etc., he concludes it with this great statement: Fear God and keep his commandments. This glorifies God and is the ultimate conclusion of Ecclesiastes. Um, so I'm going to I'm just going to show you now what I mean by the law being the glory of God because this might not be intuitive to you at first. But I will prove by scripture that this is indeed the case. So Romans 3.23, a verse everybody knows. It says, for, we have, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Over on the left-hand side. So right underneath that, I said, so sin is what makes us fall short of the glory of God. And in 1 John 3.4, it says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. So if sin is what makes us fall short of the glory of God and sin is lawlessness, therefore the law by definition equals the glory of God. This is what you, what happens when you put these two verses together and connect it. And, um, and this is why, you know, when we get to the meaning of, uh, of righteousness, uh, we're not going to do that teaching tonight. Uh, obviously to, to attain that I guess the glory uh, that God requires is to be righteous in his eyes. And we know that we can never do that on our own because we would have to meet every commandment all the time, basically never sin. And Romans 3.23 says that's impossible. Man is in hopeless uh, in trying to achieve that end. And, and that was the whole purpose of Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. So by faith in him, we, are, we attain righteousness. We attain his righteousness. It's imputed to us. So that's the whole um, you know, field, theology behind the cross. And so that's just another facet of the glory of God. In addition to everything we talked about, it's actually the Ten Commandments themselves. Um, and um, other aspects of it. So there's a few other aspects. He, is God reveals his glory to man through creation. So in Psalm 19.1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. So isn't that something? Just by looking up at the sky, looking at the trees, looking at God's creation, you are actually uh, embracing the glory of God. Not, not, nothing. It's not uh, to be taken lightly. Um, man, riches, and idols do not deserve any glory. None. Um, in Isaiah 42.8, it says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to, to carved images. In Romans 1.22-25, it says, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of God, of the incorruptible God, into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So... Um, so that's, that's probably a lot to take in. There's a, we just covered a lot of facets of the diamond there as we walked around and looked at different angles of the glory of God. But now we're going to look at probably the most beautiful and that's Jesus. Jesus himself displays God's glory. We're going to just rapid fire, read some uh, verses that are going to come ahead in, in John. And as I said, we study every verse, um, uh, with a lot of detail. So we'll get to all of these, but just, uh, to give you an overview, John 2, 11, 
the beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana, uh, Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples, disciples believed in him. In John 11, uh, 4, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Uh, John eleven forty, Jesus said to her, did I not say that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? John seven thirty nine. but he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John 12, 16, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, um, John 12, 23, but Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. John 13, 31 and 32, so when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. So there's, um, so obviously Jesus represented the glory of God and the cross and his sacrifice was the ultimate glory, the ultimate glorification of the universe. Uh, that was, that was where God's glory was, was most on display. And uh, again, when we get, um, when we get through later in John, John 17 and Especially, uh, we're going to understand the meaning of, of why the cross glorified Jesus so much. Uh, another aspect of the glory of God, it's really the purpose of our life. Um, so the purpose-driven life, uh, some people like to, to look for, this is, this is it according to the Bible. Man was created for God's glory and can be seen in things such as our love, relationships, our music, our work, etc. We are the vessels which contain his glory. In Isaiah 43, 7, it says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Um, Ecclesiastes, uh, once again, said, Fear God and keep his commandments. This glorifies God and is the ultimate conclusion of Ecclesiastes. Sin is the opposite of glorifying God. So to glorify God um, means to give glory to him as Lord in everything we do, through praise, worship, thanksgiving, obedience, and submission. To glorify God means to follow Jesus and obey his commands, to sum it all up. So there's a bit of, there's a few aspects here. And I think that, you know, there's, there's the glory of God and what it means to glorify God. And I, I've kind of put it all in this, in this teaching because I think there's um, confusion around some of this stuff or lack of teaching on it. And so even though this might have been a lot to take in, like I said, you've got the notes and you've got now um, where to look to, to learn more about this topic. So that's, that was really to signify what that, that simple word in John 1, 14, what it really embodied. You could read through that verse in five seconds or you could spend an hour on it like we have. And um, it's fascinating when you go deep. Um, <clears throat> so we're almost done on this part of the class. Uh, the last part of John 1 14 says the glory of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth. So we're going to look at what grace and truth mean now. Um, grace and truth are what describe the glory of God and it's kindness, love, mercy, and compassion, but it's also his justice. And, and that justice makes sense because that look at the 10 commandments. We said that is the glory of God. So there needs to be justice built into this. Exodus 34, 5 to 7 says, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving inequity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty. Isn't this amazing? Doesn't that sound remarkably similar to John 1.14? And yet this is this was uh, 2,000 years prior or 1,500 years before Jesus. This is what, what Moses is writing in Exodus. And, and he's describing um, the glory of God in the same language that John is describing Jesus in. Gracious and truth, forgiving inequity. So the glory that God revealed to Moses is the same glory as Jesus revealed but it was not perceived by everyone, only those who put their faith in him. 
Um, so we'll continue on here. Now I'm actually going to add verse 17 here. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So okay, so that this is so I just I just skipped out verse 14, 15 and 16 here, so you can connect these two. You see how this is all related. Grace and truth are mentioned again. Um, but the law was given to Moses, grace and truth to Jesus. So grace, under grace, God gives righteousness as a free gift to those who trust Jesus. Uh, so in Titus, it says we're justified by grace. The law, in contrast, uh, connected to Moses and works under which God demands righteousness from us uh, and blessings accompany obedience. So there was, there was always grace before Christ, um, through sacrifices and faith saved in anticipation of the cross. But Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross began a new dispensation where grace reigned in its fullness. So um, that's, that's part one of tonight's class. But, um, I hope you in, um, I hope you were able to take that in. It's a lot. Uh, but please uh, go to the website, crossordertruth.org afterwards, download these notes, and open up your Bible and, um, and spend some time on this because it's very, very important. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. And I think um, since we made such good time, I'll probably uh, start the next uh, part in a separate recording. I'm just going to take a little break here.